Are you sheltering in place, isolated, feeling alone? <coughs> well, then you're just like us. Hit me. From Studio P in Sausalito, the home of the quarantined hit, it's time for... Suckatash. Suckatash Shut-In, the Soundcast stimulus package featuring snippets from comedy... Soundcasts. And now, here's your host for this episode, Tyson Saner! Saner. Saluton, estes me, Tyson Saner. Wow. Seems like only a couple of weeks ago I was putting the finishing touches on episode 200 of Succotash, the comedy soundcast soundcast, and sending it off to executive producer Mark Hershon to be posted as the final episode before hiatus. Well, if you're listening to this, it means that hiatus is over. If you listened to episode 201 hosted by Mark Hershon, then you already knew that. If you haven't listened to episode 201 yet, you still can. It's a shorter episode than Succotash traditionally is, so it won't take very long. And it explains why it is shorter, and why we are back, and really has some great content that should help you, the listener, get into the swing of things for this new phase of the Soundcast, formerly known as Succotash, the comedy Soundcast, Soundcast, now known as Succotash Shut In. Coming to you weekly with alternating hosts Mark Hershon and yours truly, the aforementioned Tyson Saner. I've got clips from Second Run Movie Pod, You Need to See This, and Shink. I know you're anxious to experience your now-weekly dose of Soundcast clips from the comedy world as it deals with the quarantine that everybody who doesn't want to die from COVID-19 is adhering to for the foreseeable future. So, without further ado, it's clip time. First up tonight, Second Run Movie Pod, featuring Corey Epps and Adam Schumacher. On Second Run Movie Pod, the two hosts uh, talk about films they've seen and whether or not they'd give them a second look. At least I believe that's what the show is about. In this episode, Corey and Adam gotta go fast as they talk about Sonic the Hedgehog and Birds of Prey. I did somewhat of uh, somewhat of a little bit of research on the past uh, movies that they tried to attempt for Sonic the Hedgehog, but let's talk about this first, and I'll get into that first. Well, um, uh, let's talk about like video game movies, like like your history growing up with video games well, and stuff. Video game movies, mm-hmm. of course, have never been that successful. You mm-hmm. got your Mario, you got your um, your Super Mario Brothers, you got your Tomb Raider, Cradle like, of Life, the Super Mario Brothers movie. Yeah, I was like, man, that was rough. Um, that's really all we need to say about that. Yeah, <laughs> but we still get like, uh, like you know, the John Leguizamo of it. <laughs> And Dennis Hopper just chewing up the scenery. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Man, that movie is so bad. And, but yes, yeah, like, the idea of video game movies um, mm-hmm. typically are done because of the popularity of the game, so they're going to take something popular and try to make more money off of it. I would say, like, maybe Mortal Kombat kind of holds up. Uh, but, but in a first bad, in, a, in like a B movie kind of way, you could that... watch it for fun, nostalgia, Mortal Kombat, and the soundtrack and everything. Yeah, it ha- it's kind of like a nostalgia time capsule of the period. Um, I mean, compared to Street Fighter, the movie uh, I think is way more watchable. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, Street Fighter, the movie, horrible. Uh, like these ideas of, of trying to make a video game make. It doesn't translate very well. No. Um, so the fact that they were able to make a watchable Sonic the Hedgehog movie, and I feel like even building up to it, there was this whole thing where whoever was writing it or trying to make the movie essentially proposed something to Sega. I'm assuming they saw a script or something. But yeah. Sega, it seemed like they were very heavily involved in their property not being turned into a laughing stock. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they hired, like, it seemed like they hired the right people to make the movie, and, uh, they did some pretty clever stuff with it. <laughs> yeah, they, um, they did some really good stuff with it. They especially, like, let's, let's get to the beginning of, of this, where we first saw the Sonic the Hedgehog trailer, and that was not Sonic <laughs> at all. They went through a literal, a, a, a redesign for Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, because a lot of people were not happy about the way he looked. He looked too humanoid, pretty much, they said. 
It looked weird. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it looked the weird teeth. Uh, essentially, he just didn't look like Sonic. No. It looked like Sonic, but then you, like, tweaked certain things, and it just kind of seemed like a horror show, which yeah. it was. And then you had all this... I mean, I can never remember a time where something got so much backlash that the filmmaker was like, all right, we heard you. We're going to go back and do all this stuff. And, and having a background personally in, like, animation and motion graphics... The idea of having to go back and rebuild the character and re-render everything, um, I think it paid off. I yeah. Mean, I think, uh, but I don't. I hope it paid off for the animators. But, <laughs> um, but I think they could at least be like, "Hey, the movie made some money, and yeah, it's it's an enjoyable flick." But mm-hmm. yeah, that was so weird. The backlash and then changing a thing. Imagine how that would go for every type of movie and then maybe you have the dc movies i don't know <laughs> i mean there was definitely there's definitely been some backlash for certain movies um that have been out there uh just it's that one was just really it was very it was the first time i've ever actually seen the studio take actual hold of what the fans actually wanted mm-hmm. you know um and it was just it's mostly because it was the teeth of it all. But then, of course, we got the redesign, and it did also it also made me wonder what tails would have looked like then. You can find Corey Epps at OnlyFans dot com forward slash Corey Epps. There's other deets are provided on the blog, and there's a little note that says uh, that was the last episode before the quarantine lockdown due to the, to the coronavirus. And they hope everybody is staying safe and healthy. We're trying, Corey. We'll try to get more episodes out to you guys as best as possible. Fair enough. This portion of Succotash is brought to you by Henderson's Breakaway Trousers. For the first time available to the public, Henderson's Breakaway Trousers are the ideal solution for you, whether you are a man suffering from weak bladder syndrome or premature ejaculation. How many times have you been running late for that important business meeting only to find that your bratty bladder doesn't care about snaps, buttons, zippers, and belts? And who hasn't been on that date of a lifetime with that hottie that everyone wants to bang? You'd like to make a good showing, but gosh darn it, those pesky spermatozoa want out, and they want out now. Friends, when you're sporting a pair of Henderson's breakaway trousers... You've got the confidence to know that you'll be down to nothing in no time at all. And before you can say, Jack Robinson, it's bombs away and you're good to go. Originally designed for the military, the theater, and penitentiary, penitentiary, jails, Henderson's breakaway trousers are available online and wherever fine pants are sold. Available soon in women's styles, too. That's Henderson Breakaway Trousers. And now back to more of Succotash. Henderson's Breakaway Trousers. Man, I wish I had a pair on right now. I really could use them. Thank you, Bill Haywatt. And thank you, Mark Hershon. Next up, you need to see this with Luce and Cozy. In the description, it says, Join hosts Luce, Tomlin Brenner, and Cozy Orlin every week as they argue for one film you absolutely need to watch. They'll cover everything from lesser-known art house indies to, quote, how did you miss this, unquote, blockbusters. Sorry, that was open quotes, how did you miss this, and tarot bang, close quotes, blockbusters. Each episode, at least one of the hosts has seen and loved the film, and at least one has missed it. Then, with no spoilers, they'll convince you to spend your precious time watching it. That's a great idea. Now, the clip I've got to you uh, is from an episode posted on April 20th, uh, 2020, the guest, none other than uh, one of the co-hosts on the Nooner podcast on Kevin Smith's Modcast Network, Cassandra Cardenas. Also, by the way, a uh, guest of Antisocial Show, another soundcast that I uh, contribute to and edit. Co-host, actually. With Hunter Block, who was a guest of Succotash in our previous season. Check that out sometime. Anyway... As it says in the description, this week's special guest is Cassandra Cardenas, and uh, in it, Cassandra and Cozy talk to Lucy about the incredibly fun British comedy Spice World from 1997. Today we are going to speak about Spice World, the Spice Girls movie. Yes. Woo, 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 woo. Ooh, the 1997 film Spice World, which Lucy has never seen, and I I'm... saw growing up. 
Never yeah. seen it. I feel like this is a funny episode that people will see in their like podcatcher and think that it's me. That I feel like it, it lines up with what I would do on the podcast, but I like this is a fun bait and switch. That <laughs> it's you two, and I've never, I've never seen it, and I don't know any Spice Girl song except for their one big hit. Do they only have one hit? If you oh, want to be a lot of hits. Oh my god! Okay. <laughs> oh, hit. okay. I wonder That's which a... one she thinks it is. Wow, this if is a comedy my... podcast. <laughs> If you want to be my lover, you got to get with my friends. Yes, that is their okay. first single. That's okay, the one that well, broke them, so, yeah. Yeah. So, I mm-hmm. love that phrase because it sounds like it means it destroyed their lives. <laughs> the single that broke them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, so, yeah, yeah that was the last point. time I heard uh, Spice Girls was at, uh, I think, like my seventh or eighth grade dance. And I wow. haven't listened to them since. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you're going to want to. Okay, <laughs> great. I'm excited to, to hear more about it. Yeah, Cassandra, I'm guessing you were like a huge Spice Girls fan growing up? It was blinding. Um, <laughs> I, I don't remember how to do most like math, but I do still know every <laughs> lyric to every Spice Girls song ever. Um, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's just frozen in time for me. I and, and like boy bands, everything that was out at the same time, I just didn't didn't give a fuck. I was like, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm busy. I got my Spice Girls. They have like they have two albums that are worth listening to. I haven't listened to anything after uh, Jerry left. That's Ginger Spice. Um, sure, but you don't need to. Most people haven't. It's just, it's perfect the way, it's like Star Wars, where apparently, <laughs> from what I understand, it's those three that are good, and then the rest of them, you know, are pretty, like, divisive and bad. Or, I don't know. They all do, yeah, they do seem very, very divisive. That's what I'm saying, like, you know, that's, this is, this is my pod, when I'm on the podcast, it just, I'll say half, half statements, and, you know, I mean, it sounds like you're fitting in perfectly. <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> that's amazing so I like the idea that you were like Britney Spears missed you like, well like... I mean I don't want to be crazy uh, <laughs> Jerry, Jerry left the band in 1998 and um, Britney Spears came out I feel like she started getting big baby one more time probably 99 mm-hmm. maybe 2000 so I was there to convince or to consume Britney Spears but I was also like this weird like confused like queer girl also so like I didn't know what the fuck was going on all I knew was I was like I'm not interested in these uh boy bands uh they don't they're not clicking in my brain right this second Oh, yeah. I hated that shit. I have this, like, memory of sitting around my freshman year, like, lunch table, and everyone was passing around the first Sync album. And I was just, like, so grumpy about it. And I was like, I want to listen to They Might Be Giants. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, shit, you were cool. And everybody, oh, such a nerd, though. Nobody else, everyone was like, this is dumb nerd, like, music. Oh, my God. (laughs) I remember that there was like a Disney Disney Channel had like a concert series and that was the first time I ever seen in sync and I do know that there was like something about Justin Timberlake's like ramen hair that was very like sexually triggering for me. Yes, um, that happened to everybody. I did yeah. not understand it. <laughs> and I always wonder what that must feel like to be a Justin Timberlake or a Justin Bieber or things like that or like a you know One Direction and just know that like you don't have to think about it all the time but you know that you really really fucked with some preteen like sexuality like that's a weird thing i don't know why i brought that up but like you know no i think that's really interesting and i what i was reading about what i was reading about this movie i didn't know that like the spice girls had a ton of male fans like teen boys loved the spice girls and i had no idea and I was like, oh, they must, it must have been the same thing. And if you like, you can support this podcast at anchor.fm forward slash you need to see this forward slash support.
This episode of Succotash is sponsored in part by TrumpPoetry.com, a chronological ode to a fake muse. Enjoy a rhyming spin on the news of the day every day, as well as over 500 archived daily verses thoroughly covering the White House, America, and the world with a sticky caramel coating that's impossible to remove. That's T-R-U-M-Poetry.com. Everything you need to know in rhyming couplets. Trump Poetry. From May 2nd, 2020, number 263. So Stephanie Grisham is done, and the McEnany era has begun. In her first press to do, said, I won't lie to you. I'm guessing that's lie number one. Right? Right. Finally up tonight, Shank from Sarah Weinshank. In it, comedian Sarah Weinshank interviews comedians, musicians, and artists living in L.A. Topics include fashion, cannabis, and comedy. The clip is from the episode that posted April 29th, 2020, called Weather Women, Lava Lamps, and Dream Cars, in which, live from quarantine, comedian Sarah Weinshank sits down to answer some questions. She talks everything from Weather Women to her dream car and her favorite type of cat. Let me tell you, takeout food just hits harder now. Like There is a period of time when... I uh, I gotta be honest. I didn't appreciate takeout. I thought you know it's, it's an option, but ugh, why do it? I didn't really fully appreciate takeout, but now I appreciate the taste of food that I did not cook and food that I do not have to clean up. That is what I miss more than anything. Like this is my ideal weekend. Okay, pretend. Just take this voyage with me. <sighs> I wake up. It's no longer the global pandemic. It just magically cured. There's a vaccine. Who knows? Just pretend. Ideal fantasy. This is just a fun fantasy. Just take this journey with me. Okay. I wake up. I go downstairs. I say, you know what? I'm going to start the day with a spin class. Go to spin. Get an oat latte because a bitch loves an oat latte. And you know what? There's something about spin class that I like. I don't know why. I know a lot of people think spin's weird. They're like, oh, yeah, you're like a weird hamster. Like, if you want to be outside, just go on an actual bike ride. I don't know. I fucks with the spin bike. I think it's fun. I like putting on music really loud and really aggressively paddling and like getting out my anger that way. And I may not seem like an angry person and I don't think that I am. But I do think that not having sex mixed with the pandemic is starting to affect me. Just being honest, this is a safe space on Shank. Um, Okay, let's see. What else do I have? Haircut. Yes. Also, like, okay, being quarantined with your parents can be a lot. But I'm also seeing couples that are quarantined together. And that seems like that could be a lot, too. Like, just locked in with your lover imagine like living in a studio with one with your lover after a while you'd be like dude you don't even feel like my lover anymore we're just home all day poor because it's the pandemic sitting in our own filth like trying to like wash our hands and not touch our face and like we've already done all the sexual positions there are to do because the world's ending so we're just like fuck it let's fuck but then after you've come a bunch of times what do you do when you're just locked up with somebody i guess you connect and you like watch tv and like have a person i don't know i'm really out of the practice of being in a relationship I'm just having a free-flowing conversation right now with myself about pandemic relationships. Um, I cannot imagine having to teach a child. Can you imagine, like, having to teach a 16-year-old boy? Like, what what math is that even? Algebra 2? No. Absolutely not, dude. The thought of having, like, a teenager that I'd have to, like, homeschool and, like, teach algebra 2 to or, like, trigonometry to or, like, chemistry to is haunting. Like, just that thought. It's, like, imagine having a teen at home that already just doesn't want to be around you because you're its mother, his or her mother, and then... They can't leave the house and they're pissed off because they can't leave the house and they're like have a lot of teen angst. I don't know. I was just like, I just can't imagine doing that. Like, 
whenever I think of having a kid, I always think of having a baby, not like as like, oh, an adult. Do I want to have an adult in the world? A questionable adult? Um, <laughs> who knows? Who's to say? These are all things that keep me up at night. Um, yeah, but it's like, imagine, I just cannot imagine you sign up to be a mom. The next thing you know, you're a teacher, a mom, a chef. It's a lot of shit to be. And you're just like trapped at home with your family. Woo! Not only can you find the show on iTunes, Stitcher, and probably Apple Podcasts, if you want to email the show, you can email all fashion slash guest related questions to shank.pod at gmail.com. Shank is spelled S H E N K. And there it is. Remember, if you go to www.succotashshow.com, you can find all the social media and website info that will help you find these shows with very little effort on your part. Of course, our archive of past episodes is there too. Just a few simple keystrokes and mouse clicks or taps on a mobile device brings you more of us and those we feature on this program. Tell them Succotash shut in sent you. We'd appreciate it a great deal. Sharing is caring, and not only is it something we can safely do at a distance, it's what we mean when we gently remind you to please pass the Succotash. You've been listening to Succotash Shut In, the Soundcast Stimulus Package, with your host, Tyson Saner. Brought to you by Henderson's Pants, TrumpPoetry.com, and... Imagine your company's name right here. Find us on the web at SuccotashShow.com, on iTunes, on Stitcher, on iHeartRadio, on YouTube, on SoundCloud, on the <laughs> laughable app, and tattooed on your mother's rear end. You can hear us streaming and like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at Succotash Show. Email us at T-Y-S-O-N at SuccotashShow.com. Or call into the Succotash Skype line at our toll call number 818-921-7212. The number again is 818-921-7212. You can also upload clips from your favorite comedy soundcast directly to us using our direct upload link at Hightail.com slash U slash Succotash. Production of Succotash is overseen by Joe Paulino through the auspices of Studio P. Sausalito, the home of the hit. Our hosts are Mark Hershon and Tyson Saner. Our musical director is Scott Carvey. Our booth assistant is still Kenny Durgis. And until next time, I'm your loyal booth announcer, Bill Haywatt, reminding you to please wash your hands and pass the Succotash. Goodbye. Goodbye.